Let me go back to slide one. Oh, um, you know what? Since we have to record this section, I think all of you need to, a little uh, thing has probably come up on your screen and you have to agree that we can record. Mm. So could everyone do that and press? I think it's got it, right? Just say, just say yes. You <laughs> just say yes. <laughs> okay. As I um, try to figure out my full page display. How did I know this before? View. Full screen mode. Okay. Gosh, speak it. Okay. So today we are talking about primarily pests, some disease. Um, we saw a little bit in the, the video of, of some of the early pests. Um, but to begin with, we want to make sure that like our first line of defense is, oops, hold on, let me get back to my screen. There, okay. So first line of defense is of course prevention, right? And so healthy soil is going to produce much more resilient plants. So you wanna make sure that um, if you're establishing garden beds, whatever, that you, you pay attention to the soil, right? You wanna make sure that um, if you have beneficial insects like ladybugs or praying mantises that they are comfortable <laughs> in, in your place. Um, crop rotation also helps. Um, and then of course, as you're selecting seeds, um, finding ones that are disease or, or pest resistance is uh, very, very helpful. Second line of defense, you can look to things like the, the Rutgers Master Gardener IPM team report. Um, this you can just look up online, you can get alerts from them. And so you start to understand like at what point certain pests are becoming problematic. Um, yeah, so there's Mariana, lots of them. I, we yeah. post these on the NOFA website as well when Rutgers sends them out. So yes. you can find them on the Rutgers I, uh, Master Gardener IPM site, or you can also find them on NOFA. So super cool. Um, but yeah, so you can see like new problem soon caterpillar on kale, three line potato peel, rhubarb leaf spot, and slugs. Um, I have lots of slugs in my own garden and um, it's, it's nice to know when, when these guys are, are starting to appear. Um, so to get into some specifics, and these are kind of the most common pests that we, that we have here in kind of the Northeast region. The first one is the imported cabbage worm or like the European cabbage worm. Um, they are super keen on the brassica family. So anything that is um, within like cabbage, kale, Brussels sprouts, collards, broccoli, um, all of that, they absolutely love it. And they are perfectly camouflaged to that <laughs> particular plant. Um, you saw in the video um, how, how they are camouflaged that way. Um, obviously, it, it's best to, to find them before they have wreaked havoc, um, but the best way is like in, in this bottom right hand image, you can see the eating patterns of them. And then in the, the left hand image, um, the actual worm, right? And so, you can manually remove them um, as well as the eggs. So you'll want to start to recognize um, the eggs. You can see the little um, butterflies going around um, laying their eggs. 
um, and so you can smush the eggs. You can also put out um, yellow sticky traps to, to catch the adult butterflies, um, but those also might catch beneficial insects. And so you always have to weigh um, the, the cost and, and benefit, if you will, in terms of what you do to prevent pests and what it can do to beneficial insects. Um, BT, if you have a severe infestation, BT is an option that is uh, a naturally occurring, it's um, Bacillus thuringiensis. Um, so it's a, a bacteria that basically shuts down the um, digestive system of any kind of worms. Um, so that is imported cabbage worm. Um, this. Um, aphids, which, um, as you saw from the video, we have we had a slightly unexpected um, infestation of, of aphids. Um, what happens is that they excrete this like the sticky honeydew substance, um, which is a, it's a byproduct of their feeding, but it will bring in um, a mildew, and so. Um, it, it ends up causing this, this problem with photosynthesis, as you can see from the, the notes here. And so that's why aphids are a problem. They don't really damage the leaves, um, but they will um, inhibit the, the plant's ability to, to, to grow. And so the, the best um, method, if you have an infestation, is going to be through uh, an organic insecticidal soap, which is just, you know, a spray, um, super easy. You just want to make sure that you spray early in the morning um, so that the, the plants don't get sunburned. Um, flea beetles, um, there are many species of flea beetles, and they will attack numerous different kinds of plants. Um, they are, they are called flea beetles because um, they have an incredible ability to jump like fleas when they're bothered. Um, they're small and shiny um, and they have large real rear legs, which allows them to, to jump. Um, and they will lay their eggs at the base of plant stems in early summer after they've finished a feeding period. And then the larva will feed at the roots. So adult beetles, um, which are super tiny still, um, they, they will feed on foliage um, and they will also overwinter in brush and wooded areas. So they mostly pose a threat early in the planting season. So as they're emerging and, and coming back into, um, into their um, life cycle. So prevention, um, road covers, um, etc. Vegetable leaf miners um, are one of my least favorite pests. I don't know if I have a favorite pest, <laughs> but um, these guys love my Swiss chard and what happened, so it's a, this little fly, right? Um, but it will lay its eggs um, in, basically in between the layers of the leaf material. And so the larva will then um, kind of tunnel through the leaves hence the name miners. Um, and, and so they kind of create this serpentine like pattern through your leaves, which you can see in the, the bottom right image. Um, and you can see the, the larva on the left bottom image, which, you know, it looks like a maggot. It's a, it's a fly larva. Um, you again can use flooding row covers 
to, to prevent this. Um, and, and what's good is that you can um, try, to try to prevent um, this through some of the, the cultural management. Oh, people should feel free to ask questions if they have them as we go. Yes. So, yeah, because yeah. you know me, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna like talk about bugs because I love them. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, if you if you have questions, please pipe up or or put something in the chat. Um, for now, I'll, I'll continue. So, cucumber beetle. Um, and, and there are a couple of different types of cucumber beetle. So you can see them there as the spotted one and then the striped one. Um, and they will typically go after your cucurbits. So um, all of your, your squashes. So cucumber, uh, squash, etc. And the, the larva will feed on the roots. Um, adults will feed on the leaves. But it's, it's not so much the feeding on the plant that's problematic, but it's the fact that they, they often carry bacterial disease and, and viruses from plant to plant. So they will carry things like mosaic virus. Um, and once that happens, um, there's a really not a lot you can do. Um, and I realized I, I misspelled destroy. Hey, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Thank God. Go. Oh, I think I'll just mute people who are unmuted right now. You can keep going, Maria. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so, so some of the problem with, with pests is that it's not so much that they'll eat the plants, but they can bring in diseases. And this is one of those, um, this is one of those dudes. Um, so, so looking to, to prevent that. Um, then we have our Colorado potato beetle, um, which is a real um, humdinger of a, a pest. Um, they, as you can tell from the name, Colorado potato beetle, they tend towards potatoes, but they will also come on to your tomatoes and eggplants because they're all in that same um, family, right? So um, you want to look out for them. Their eggs are very prominent. So bottom left hand image, um, super orange, super easy to squish. Um, so I recommend um, just squishing with your thumb. Um, whether you want to wear gloves or not is up to you. Um, up to their um, larva you know, stage. They really where they should wear up. gloves, even though you never do. Because they're really, they stain your fingers. <laughs> yes i should wear gloves but, um i don't uh, well you at least warn them that it's like this ooey gooey red mess Ugh. okay so it's slightly ooey gooey and especially once you get to the the bottom right hand stage it's gross <laughs> so, um, you might want you you might want gloves to, for the bottom right hand mushing. So, um, so just be be aware of these dudes. Um, now we're going to get into a couple of diseases of the plant. So we're we're switching from actually the um, the pests to the diseases. Um, this first one is about blossom end rot. Um, so this is a physiological problem. 
And what happens is that the fruit becomes water soaked at the blossom end, hence the, the name blossom end rot. Um, so the, the tissues collapse, they dry out rapidly, and then they leave this weird kind of papery, yucky end. Um, and then that leaves it open to a secondary kind of fungal infection that, that will um, create more, more fungal, um, more fungal. So the way to prevent this, right, is to make sure that you have a good calcium balance in your soil. You wanna make sure that you're watering things evenly because if plants are stressed through like, you know, a drought period and then heavy rain, drought period, heavy rain, um, they're, they're gonna be much more susceptible to um, this kind of, of thing. So um, there, there's not a whole lot you can do. Um, because it's, it's not like an insect or a disease. Um, it, you can't, once, once um, blossom and rot has set into a plant, um, you, you just wanna <laughs> um, do, I don't know, like, um, what's it called? Um, not CPR, but just like, <laughs> um, do what, you, do what you can to, to salvage things. Um, and then um, Phythoptera um, is, is kind of similar. And so that is a, a blight. Um, again, another fungus. And so you'll, you'll notice um, like these black lesions on, on stems or leaves and roots. Um, you wanna make sure that that you have good drainage to, to prevent this. Okay, so moving on. Um, I don't know why. There we go. Uh, another one that is super, super common is um, downy mildew and powdery mildew on, on um, the cucurbit family. Again, this is another fungus. Um, you'll start to see this as kind of this yellow angular spots on, on the upper leaf surface. And, and then you might, to, might see downy growth on the lower leaf surfaces. Um, best bet is to, to plant resistant varieties and also um, limit overhead irrigation. Same with powdery mildew. Again, you'll, you'll notice this patterning on, on the leaves. Um, and, and with this one, uh, underside of, of leaves are, are typically covered with, with kind of this powdery um, mildew substance. Yeah, so what you folks probably don't know is that Ariana teaches landscape architecture at Rutgers. <laughs> And um, Rutgers actually has a wonderful um, basil variety that's disease resistant to downy mildew. Yes. And it really does work. So, yeah. you know, if you, if you have, if you encounter the problem this season, likely you can still order seeds and for the last succession of basil, you can probably still have basil this year. Absolutely. Right. Thank you for that plug, Nagisa. <laughs> And, and again, if, if there are any questions, please, let's see. I see there is something in the chat. Yeah, there, I, don't. I think we should um, talk about bigger pests once you're done with this. Oh, like deer? Okay, and I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll quicken up. Um, so tomatoes, blight. You probably all heard of blight, which again is another fungus. Um, dark brown circle, circular spots will, will um, show up on your leaves. Um, again, the best course of defense is to, of course, use healthy plants, but then also 
rotating in your garden space, right? So you're not growing the, the same thing um, year after year in the same spot. Um, blossom end rot, again, it's this physiological problem. Um, the, the fruit becomes water soaked near the blossom end and um, it, it just gets yucky. So you wanna make sure that, that you have good, uh, good nutrients in your soil. Um, what Nagisa was just mentioning about um, basil, um, we have this crazy tendency um, that literally like moves up from Florida every year, right? Like this, this basil downy mildew, it is on a continual circuit um, up the coast. Um, and what you'll notice is on the underside, you'll start to see this weird paneling, right? The, the yellowing of the leaf, um, it gets this weird gross spork or, you know, fuzz. Um, and you can, as it says here, try Rutgers Downy Mildew Rustin variety. So um, that's, that's the best way I would suggest. Um, and finally, and I'm not a, a big fruit grower, so this is a little bit out of my wheelhouse, but there is an, an anthracnose fruit rot um, which might get your um, strawberries. And so, of course, like using disease free plants, um, but also those that might have more resistance. So, again, just make sure um, that you look for, for those that are well situated for your environment. And then also pay attention to rotation and making sure that um, the, the ground around them is, is not saturated. Yeah, I think um, last week we had uh, the CSA cooking class and Jim Kinzel showed us his farm and his growth of mm -hmm. strawberries. And what he said was the, to avoid it completely he treats them as an annual crop instead of a perennial mm. um, because it tends to build in a certain location. And so that is a solution if you encounter the problem. If you don't, then I think you might be okay. But that is generally what he's suggesting. Interesting. Um, and, and we do have some, some resources here. So looking at the, you know, through Rutgers, et cetera. Um, and I think, I think the geese of these will all be published for. Yes, um, they'll be in the PowerPoint and I'll post so, Yes. Um, so I'm gonna stop sharing and I would love to open it up to any questions that folks might have. Yeah, so I think um, Greg's question was first. He wants to know what to do about um, groundhogs. And of course, what I suggested to him was if you bury a wire fencing one to two feet down, um, you can generally discourage the groundhogs. But if you have big groundhogs, you need to go deeper or get a dog. <laughs> so, well, or you can trap them. You can trap them. He said that's a lot of <laughs> necessary work. A groundhog will go up to a fence and try to dig at, at the fence. Right. Uh, if you, you can go ahead and bury it and, it, and it'll be effective, but it's, it's an awful lot of work. If you take that fencing, instead of burying it, to lay it flat on the ground, you got to come out at least 16 inches. You're, you're doing the same thing, and it's about one tenth of the work. <laughs> um, <laughs> right. Now, there are groundhogs that learn how to climb, and I found that they seem to climb wooden fence posts better than they do other types of fences. Um, so, if you have fences that are that are generally metal posts, um, I don't think they're quite as likely to climb. And generally, groundhogs don't. It's not their. It's not in their initial nature to climb. I think they learn how to climb because if you, there's a tree around with fruit on it, you know, whether it be peaches, apples, maybe cherries, then they'll learn how to climb, and they could do the same thing to your fence. If there's none of those around, 
uh, it's not their initial, it's not their initial uh, habit to do that. Um, and sometimes I've, you know, I've caught ones that climb, take it away. Uh, and then I don't get one that learns how to climb for another four or five years. So. Yeah. Or, I mean, shotgun is another possibility. <laughs> yeah. And if, if you, if you want to trap it, uh, you know, the heart, have a heart trap seem to work. Um, it, it's better. Some of the have a heart traps only have one entrance. And yeah. I found that, that those actually work best. If you have one that's got two entrances, which I do, I only use one inch. I only keep one entrance open because mm -hmm. sometimes they'll come in the back way and they'll grab what's in there and they never step on the, the little pad that makes it go off. So, you know, again, just use, use one entrance. Um, you know, cantaloupe seems to work probably better than anything, but, you know, other types of fruit work too. And it looks like you're holding something up. <laughs> oh, that's a cup of coffee, Ariana. And, that was no one. <laughs> and, and drive them like, at least 10 miles away. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and and was, put was, down newspaper in your your trunk because they're stinky and their poop is awful. So uh, they do carry so, tips. And, and, and having having transported <laughs> numerous <laughs> groundhogs from my garden to the canal um, mm -hmm. three miles down the road. So so um, um I think Diana's asking a question. Yeah. What can I do when the stem of the squash begins to rot before mm. it starts bearing fruit? I think it's the same problem, blossom and So it's, you might have um, squash, bor uh, squash vine borers. Um, and what happens is it's this little, Again, like this little wasp, it will lay its egg right at the base, like kind of where the, the squash plant um, branches out and it will lay its egg and then a larva. So kind of like a, a giant maggot will grow inside of the, the squash stem. So squash stems are, are kind of hollow and and it will eat it and cause the entire rest of the plant to kind of die so you may have squash vine borer issues diana um and uh a Can good that? way yeah al go ahead yeah um yeah i, I would agree with that uh but um, squash vine borer are very specific. There's just one generation a year, and it and it exhalates somewhere around now. It, it's it's something like I think we talked about degree days last last session, and mm -hmm. it's somewhere around 800 degree days above 50. Um, maybe in the Giza, if if we get to that stage, we can put out a blast to everybody <laughs> to watch out for uh, the vine borer. Um, but uh, your plant is not necessarily lost, depend upon how advanced right. it gets. Um, the, the, the veins of the plant run, you know, parallel to the way the, the, the vine is growing. And it's possible to take a knife and cut parallel to the way the, the vine is growing. And yeah. you might be able to find the little caterpillars in there. Uh, mm -hmm. It's actually, and, and the other thing is it's actually, uh, Ariana, it's not a, I don't think it's a fly. I think it's a, a, like a moth or a, a, a butterfly because it's Lepidoptera. Uh, be, be it is, yeah, it's a yeah. moth. Yeah, yes. BT will actually affect it. I have a little, uh, I don't know what it, what it is actually. Somebody gave it to me because I, I think I have a reuse for that. It's like a little syringe, except it doesn't have a point on it. And I can actually inject a little bit of BT, uh, which is the Bacillus synergiensis in, in a liquid form, which Ariana talked about before, into the, into the base of the plant if I see something or if I suspect something. And I, you know, knock on wood, it's worked for the last few years. I can't say it's 100% effective. And if you have too many plants, it's a lot of work. But, you know, if you happen to have livestock or something, you have a, a, an extra syringe around, you, you, could, you could do it with a syringe. Um, and uh, yeah, again, it seems to be fairly effective. So I think that actually covers all the questions that are in the chat. Does anybody have any remaining questions? 
because we might be done for the day. Anyone at all? Want to sort of talk about the deer? Sure, oh. go for it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I was just thinking about it with the groundhog situation. We have rabbits and, and, and groundhogs and all of that um, and the deer, but my solution for a lot of that, if you, well, if you have raised beds, it's a lot easier because you can build a simple cage to go over your low growing plants. Um, and that will keep most things out. Um, if you've got, you know, raccoons or something like that, you might want to put a little latch or hinge on it just to kind of make it a little harder to push aside. Um, but they quite often I found that they will keep the deer out as well. I don't know why, since deer are perfectly capable of kicking it over if they felt like it. But I have found that a little hardware, uh, hardwire cloth cage um, seems to keep them out. Now the other thing, what I use is I actually just use electric fence, and I haven't I haven't had a deer problem at all in the area with the electric fence, and they're not. You know, they, the ones that I, I so I, I have the Premier One um, fencing and it's, I think 60, they have a 60 and a 68 inch high, which is still plenty short enough for a deer to clear, but they tend to not want to do it, especially if you keep it on. They, they put their nose to it one time and they learn to respect that fence. The key is to make sure that it's actually on, you know, on a regular basis. But it, you know, it's just another way. If you have tall, obviously, if you have tall plants, you can't put a cage on it. You know, if you're doing taller plants like potatoes that are going to grow really high or corn, I mean, there are people who will tell you there are various ways you can protect corn with cages. But I just find them kind of fiddly and difficult. But the electric fencing is, I have, I have found it well worth the money in terms of keeping the deer up because there aren't many things other than putting in high deer fencing that's going to protect your food. So, and I do the same thing for the groundhogs and the rabbits and the raccoons and, and that sort of thing. So just, a, just my, my thought on the whole pest thing. Quarter inch, quarter inch cloth is, is best because it also keeps mice out if you make the cage flush to the bed. Um, half inch will do fine for your bigger critters like groundhogs and raccoons and deer but that quarter inch will keep out mice as well. Great. Thank you. It's great. Okay, everyone, this is your last chance to ask a quick question. Otherwise, you can always email me and we can cover it in the next session. And next time, I think we settled on, we're gonna flip. We were gonna do fruit next month and then do the following month fall crops, but we've decided to do the fall crops earlier so that you guys can get a jump on them. And then we'll, we'll cover the small fruit in August and finish up with um, preparing your beds for the fall and winter. Okay, so have a wonderful evening, everyone. And thank you very much for dialing in again. All right, take care, enjoy the weather. Happy growing. Bye. Bye. Bye.